This is part two of a series on the RSA encryption algorithm, intro to P, Q, N, and Phi N. Now, to understand the concepts that I'm about to present, you do need to keep in mind some of the points that I brought up in my last video that I'm just going to very briefly restate here. Okay, so the first thing I need you to remember is the difference between the key generator and the sender. So again, the key generator is just the person who generates values for the six variables involved in RSA. So P, Q, N, Phi, N, E, and D. And then the sender, who is the person who sends an encrypted message to the key generator for the key generator to decrypt. So the second thing to remember is the difference between the private and the public key. Uh, you need to know that the private key is comprised of values of P, Q, Phi, N, and D, and that only the key generator can access these values. You also need to remember that the public key is comprised of the values of N and E, and everybody can access the public key. Third thing to remember is that integral assumption that RSA encryption is based off of, that factoring large semi-primes is time-consuming. Fourth thing to remember is the definition of prime numbers and semi-prime numbers. So prime numbers are, again, an, like a number that has no factors other than itself and one, and a semi-prime number is a number that is the product of two such prime numbers. Fifth and final thing to remember is that RSA encryption uses huge semi-primes like RSA 2048, which is the product of two unknown prime numbers, P and Q. Okay, so today we're going to talk about these four values of P, Q, N, and Phi N, and exactly how the key generator will go through and create values for these variables. And we'll talk about E and D in my next video. So starting off with P and Q, the key generator can set the values of P and Q to anything that he or she would like to set them to, provided that they're prime numbers. On our list of things to remember, we said that RSA typically uses huge semi-primes, which means that the prime numbers that are the products of such a semi-prime must also be huge. But for simplicity's sake, we're just going to be sticking to small values in this video. So let's say that P is 53 and Q is 61, both of which are prime numbers and both of which are relatively small. Okay, so simple enough so far. Now we're going to talk about the value of n, which is simply defined as being the product of p times q, the product of p and q. So just those two prime numbers that we picked beforehand, just their product is going to be the value of n. So in our case, we know that p is 53 and that q is 61, so we know that n is equal to 53 times 61, which is simply 3,233. So we get a value of 3,233 for n. Here I'll very quickly highlight the definition of each of these numbers. So p is a prime number, q is a prime number, and n is simply those two prime numbers multiplied together. So these are our three definitions so far and the three values that we created so far in this top right corner. These are specific to our example. Okay, so we know what P, Q, and N are defined to be, and we know their specific values for the two prime numbers that we chose to be P and Q. Now, finding the phi of N is where things start to get a little bit complicated. Okay, so the phi of a number simply tells you how many integers are less than that certain number that do not share any common factors greater than one with that number? Okay, so this sounds like a pretty convoluted definition, so let's work through an example to try to understand this better. Say I want to find the phi of 9, per se. Okay, so since this is such a small number, First, I would list all of the integers before 9, including 9, all the way down to 1. So, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 
four, three, two, and one. So I can clearly see that nine, six, and three, all three of these numbers share common factors with nine that are greater than one. I can also see that eight, seven, five, four, two, and one are all numbers that do not share any common factors with nine that are greater than one. So let's go back to our definition of the phi of a number. How many integers are less than that number that do not share any common factors greater than one with that number? Well, I see one, two, three, four, five, six integers that are less than nine that do not share any common factors greater than one with the number nine. Therefore, the phi of nine is simply six because there are six integers that are less than nine that do not share any common factors greater than one with nine. I think that we can agree that this process is pretty time consuming to compute, especially when the phi's of numbers get bigger and bigger. So this leads me to my next point, that the phi of any number is time consuming to compute except in the case of prime numbers. Now, why except in the case of prime numbers? Well, if we think back to our definition of a prime number, we see that a prime number is a number that has no factors except itself and one. So if we wanted to find the phi of a prime number, say, of seven, phi of a prime number seven, we simply have to realize that seven has six integers before it that have no common factors greater than one with seven. Therefore, the phi of 7 is simply 6, one less than the original prime number. This leads me to a definition. The phi of any prime number is simply one less than the original prime. Any prime number that you can think of, its phi is simply one less than that original prime number. From this definition, we can see that finding the phi of any non-prime number, like 9, is tedious but finding the phi of a prime number is very simple because the phi of any prime number is just one less than the original prime. Okay, so there's one more thing that I'm going to mention before I get into how we're going to calculate the phi of n. So first I need to tell you that phi is a multiplicative operation. This basically means that if I wanted to find the phi of the product of x and y, it would simply be phi of x times phi of y. Now, how is, this, how is this going to help us in relation to finding the phi of n? So finding the phi of n. We know that n is the product of p and q. So we can rewrite this as being phi of p times q. So from this definition, we can say that the phi of p times q is equal to the phi of p times the phi of q. We also know from our definition of p and q that p and q are always going to be prime numbers. And we know that the phi of any prime number is simply one less than the original prime number. So we can express the phi of p and the phi of q as being p minus 1 and q minus 1, because we know that p and q are prime numbers. So the phi of p times q, or n, the phi of n, is simply going to be p minus 1 times q minus 1. And there's our fourth definition. The phi of n, which is the product of p times q, is simply p minus 1 times q minus 1. So in our specific example, we had said that the two prime numbers p and q were 53 and 61, respectively, and that their product n was 3,233.
So we can use this definition right here, the phi of the semi-prime n, to our advantage. The phi of 3,233 would simply be 53 minus 1 times 61 minus 1. This is equal to 52 times 60, which is equal to 3,120. So we know that the phi of 3,233 is equal to 3,120. Okay, now we're going to get into the concept of something called a trapdoor one-way function in relation to this definition right here. So the phi of any semi-prime being the um, it's two, the two primes that make up that semi-prime product, p minus 1 times q minus 1. So here we go. So a trapdoor one-way function is easy to compute in one direction, but hard to compute in the opposite direction unless you have special trapdoor information. We're going to take a look how this definition applies to us knowing that the phi of n is equal to p minus 1 times q minus 1. But before we get into that, it is integral for us to remember that the public key is comprised of n and e, and the private key is composed of p, q, phi, n, and d, and that nobody but the key generator will have access to these four values. Everybody else in the world will only have access to n and e. So far, we've been considering things from the perspective of the key generator, who has access to all six of these values. It's very, very easy for the key generator to compute the phi of n, in our example 3,233, because they have the special trapdoor information of p and q, 53 and 61. They would simply plug in those values of 53 and 61 into this equation to understand that the phi of 3,233 is 3,120. So it's easy for the key generator to compute the value of phi n because they have the special trapdoor information of p and q. But how would anybody, anybody other than the key generator compute the value of phi n given that they only have the public key values of n and e? Well, there are two options that anybody other than the key generator could explore if they wanted to find the phi of, in our case, 3,233, without the special trapdoor information of P and Q, 53 and 61. Well, there are basically two options, so option one that this person other than the key generator could explore. Calculating the phi of 3,233 directly. But remember in our previous, previous example, when we tried to find the phi of 9 directly. This was a very tedious and arduous process, and it only gets, gets worse as the numbers increase, so as finding the phi of numbers increase. Finding the phi of 3,233 directly, therefore, would take far, far too long to, for, to be feasible. If we tried to find the phi of n directly for RSA 2048, for example, it would take a really, really long amount of time to calculate it. Similar, similar, similarly, as we saw with factoring large semi-primes like RSA 2048. So option two, other than finding the phi of 3,233 directly. We still know that the phi of 3,233 is some prime number p minus 1 times some prime number q minus 1, but we don't know what p and q are. We do, however, know their product, which is n. This is a public key value, so we have access to it. So what we could try to do is find the factors of 3,233. We know that these, the factors, we know that the two factors of 3,233 are p and q, so we could try to find those by factoring 3,233. 
For a small number like 3,233, this would be fairly easy to do on a desktop computer. But remember, RSA uses huge semi-primes for n, numbers like RSA 2048. RSA will never use such a small value for n. They'll use numbers like RSA 2048 instead. So, using this method, we would have to resort to manually finding the factors of RSA 2048. And in my first number, I mean, sorry, in my first video, I told you that finding the factors of RSA 2048 on a desktop computer using a brute force method would literally take longer to do than the universe has been in existence. So that option is a no-go too. We've exhausted our two viable options. We can't find the phi of n because it would take too long. And we can't try to factor n because it would take too long, again, because n is such a huge number, is typically such a huge number in RSA encryption. So here we start to see why this assumption that factoring large semi-primes is time-consuming. We start to see how clever it was for the founders of RSA encryption to use this assumption to their advantage. It would be easy, again, for the key generator to find the value of phi n because they have the trapdoor information of p and q. But it's hard for anybody else who does not have that trapdoor information of P and Q. And that's really the point of a trapdoor one-way function. Easy for whoever's creating the key, but hard for anybody else in the general public who does not have that special trapdoor information. This is part of what makes RSA encryption so incredibly secure. A hacker who would want to find the value of phi n would have long been dead by the time their computer factored n, given that n is large enough. But why is it so incredibly important to know what the value of phi n is? Well, this is incredibly important to decrypt messages. We'll see this in the following video that I'm going to make. In the next video, we'll also see the second and final utilization of a trapdoor one-way function in RSA encryption. So, in this video, we've talked about how the key generator generates values of p, q, n, and phi n. In my next video, we'll start to talk about e and d, and we'll finally answer some of those questions raised in this video as well as my first video. See you next time!